go. Okay. Um, I'm Rod Grimes. I'm one of the original founders of FreeBSD for the people that haven't ever seen me before. Um, there's been very few opportunities to hear me speak. Um, I've kind of kept myself hidden in the last 15 years or so. The, uh, um, I'm here today to talk about the early days um, of FreeBSD, about the first year to two, two years of the project, some period before then, um, that is kind of getting lost. There's been some written histories. Um, I'm here to present my version of that history. There may be some differences between my versions and other people's versions, because at that point of time, we were a very dispersed group. We were spread all around the globe. There weren't any face-to-face -face meetings between us. Um, so there are, we each saw different pieces of the project. Um, the, my starting in involvement with what became FreeBSD was, was really with the 386 BSD patch kit, which is kind of the precursor to the project. There had been Bill Jolitz and his 386 BSD distribution had been, the 0.0, .0 had probably been out for a year. The 0 0.1 had probably been out for about three or four months. And we were starting to collect lots of changes to the code. There was some new drivers being written. Um, there was some brokenness being fixed. There were some build tools being put in place to make it easier to get the system built. Um, and there were um, four of us really involved with that. Terry Lambert, who created the patch kits. Uh, Nate Williams, who was one of the, the first patch kit coordinators after Terry. Jordan Hubbard, who most of you should know. He's now with IX Systems. Um, spun a patch kit or two, and then I spun a few. I, was, I actually got started when Terry was working with it, and I did a lot of testing for him. And then we didn't see a, a release coming forward from, from Bill, a, a new release coming. And so we, there were some mailing lists for him. There were a lot of us talking on those mailing lists. There was the USNAP groups. Um, that were, were our main communications mechanisms. This is, this is pre-public internet time frame, um, 90, 91, 92. There wasn't a whole lot of public internet available. Most of it was on USENET. UUCP was still actively being used. There were some large FTP mirrors available that the distributions were, were downloaded from. Anyway, Jordan Hubbard somehow made contacts with um, Walnut Creek CD-ROM, who's our first real um, sponsor, is probably the best way to put that. They, they provided us a T1 connection to the internet, which at that time was a pretty expensive thing to do. They purchased some hardware for us. They provided um, lots of resources, really. Jack Belty and, and um, Bob, I'm drawing a blank. I'm not real good at public speaking, so I'm going to have some nerves up here. Anyway, um, why can't I remember Bob's name? That's okay. So we were provided some, some first hardware from Walnut Creek, which, which Jack went out and bought us, a, a, I believe it was a 486DX2 system. And Jordan walked him through an install over the telephone. The machine ran for about a day and a half and started panicking. Um, and Jordan contacted me and says, you know, look, we got this hardware problem down here. We can't get it running. We, we, we need to do something with that. And the, the box ended up shipped up to me in Portland, Oregon. Um, I went through it and found out it had bad cache chips in it. Um, that was fixed. I wiped, the, the install was pretty messed up at that point. I wiped it out and um, reloaded 386 BSD plus the patch kit on it, which gave me the opportunity um, to provide our host name. This was, um, comes from, I'm an active skydiver. Um, I started in about 1990, um, stopped in about 2001. And so I picked the name Freefall um, for the project, um, for, for the host. Um, Following that, we needed to come up with a project name. And this, I believe, was an open discussion on a mailing list with some possible overflow into to the USENET news groups. Uh, David Greenman, who's one of the early members of the project, was the actual person that posted the first 
name free B the name we chose, which was, was FreeBSD, um, a lot of names were passed around. We kind of voted on it as a group and ended up picking the name FreeBSD, which then gave us some starting grounds. Uh, source code control systems had to be picked, and I'm not sure who or, or exactly how that was picked. Um, I was busy with some other things at that particular two or three days. It was a very quick process and was basically said, hey, Rod, we've decided, go set up at CVS because that's what we're going to need to use. Um, I had never touched the tool at that time. My experience with source code control was RCS and SCCS. So I had to very quickly um, ramp up and figure out how to get CVS and the repository up and try and hook it into some mailing lists and, and other things. Um, once that was done, we were able to start working on the code. Um, the, because the process of creation of the repository gave me the wonderful opportunity in that I'm the only person that's never had a commit bit given to them. I just kind of took mine. Um, I had to uh, create the avail file so that I could make commits from my username instead of root to allow us to, to, to start the process rolling forward. Um, that bit's been retired so there may be a, de a opportunity for someone in the future to have actually um, given me a, a commit bit. It's actually something that, that's probably in the pipeline for the future. The other thing that you can blame me for is the creation of what we call the core team. It's evolved a lot <clears throat> over the 24 years since it was originally created. Um, I, I, though I may have a wide background in programming and operating systems. I don't know all of the pieces and all of the parts. We needed um, a, a diverse group that was able to deal with many different pieces of software. We needed people that could commit time and effort to the project to keep it running. Um, so I solicited people to go, look, do you want to become a member of the core? Do you want to you know, really get involved with the project? Um, at that time, I believe it was seven people um, I can't rattle those names off by heart. I know who some of them are. Um, we spent the next, I believe it was about nine months to get to our first release, which is the 1.0 release. There is a golden copy of that, which was made before the first um, production run of the CDs that I have archived. Hopefully the bits are still good. Um, uh, CDRs are not known for their longevity, though it is, a, it is an early technology metal film type CDR. The first release was very well received. Um, we were surprised at, at how quickly it spread. Um, and that, that occurred, I believe, in November of 1993. Somewhere either just before that or just after that, is, Jordan's not in the room, is he? Jordan Hubbard, are you in here? No. Um, Bill Jolitz, who was supposed to speak at a conference in the Netherlands, um, for some reason had to cancel on that conference. Um, Jordan or Walnut Creek CD-ROM was contacted about a replacement for it. And I kind of like to call this the zeroth conference because it wasn't, there wasn't a organized set of conferences around the BSDs. Prior to this, there have, of course, been USENICs and leases and other things that were, were conferences that a lot of BSD people attended. This was actually a, a Unix users group in the Netherlands that invited um, many BSD-related people. Um, I was there, Kirk was there, Jordan Hubbard was there, um, Paul Henningkamp, um, Blindness Tarvisald, and it, it was a, a well-rounded group of, of early open source developers um, presenting to a very large user base. I can't remember how many people were in attendance. I remember that um, it was one of my first large public presentations and stuff, and when me, me and Jordan got up on the stage, it was we were in a huge auditorium and it was packed clear to the back walls. We were just like, aha, <laughs> please. Um, the, uh, there's an often asked questions about why we have some different BSDs. Um, 
there's some history that, that there's only a few, few of us know a lot about. Um, there, there were some other people around that knew, knew there were attempts being made. There was four, three or four meetings between me and my counterpart at NetBSD, which was CDG. I'm not going to butcher his name. It, Chris. There we go. Thank you. The, um, we met three or four times up at Walnut Creek CD-ROM and, and discussed, you know, is it, gonna be, is it possible for us to merge these two diverse groups of people together and make a single project out of it? Um, the conclusion after several meetings and stuff that it would probably um, have been detrimental to attempt to do that because of, of the personnel differences and stuff of the project. And so that we basically stopped the attempt to merge the two projects. It, it, wasn't, it wasn't done lightheartedly, but it, it, uh, it was decided that would be best. I think looking back um, from today, it was a really good thing that, that has come out of that because we've seen splinters form. And if you look at the Linux community after 20 years, you have this massive tree of splinters. If you look at the BSDs, you know we haven't do, done too bad. We've got NetBSD, OpenBSD, FreeBSD, Dragonfly, and a couple of other smaller distributions. We don't have 30 or 40 different things going on. Next major event was the USL Novell um, BSD lawsuit. This hurt. Um, the lawsuit put a stop to our development efforts and it put a stop to the adoption of the code base by the community because, it, look, we don't know what's going to happen out of this lawsuit. We can't go down this road and, and invest um, large amounts of resources in something we're uncertain of of the future. There were, it's, the lawsuit I think has three or four different agreements. Unfortunately, because most of the agreements are covered under a, you can't talk about this agreement clause. Um, the contents of those agreements aren't extremely known other than the version that the University of California entered into was um, exposed by Kirk due to a um, Freedom of Information Act. Um, solicitation because the university is a public entity after that that settlement was there for so long it was possible to ask for a public release of it it's available on the internet um, if you're interested in some some interesting history and some of what the problem was it's a good read um, it's it's not an overly com complex agreement um, we had to rewind things at that point um, and drop our current CVS repository. So there are actually two copies of the CVS repository, um, which means because we basically d dropped the repository and populated a new one, if you try and look at, free, if, if you have access to FreeBSD 1 or 1.1 files, the version numbers in there will be 1.1 1 .1 or 1.1.1 .1 in the repository. And those will also be the same version file numbers in the 2.5 release, because, simply because the repository was re rewound, which, which restarted the um, revision serial numbers. It also meant we, we lost some access to some of the early history. And if you're trying to go back and figure out why something was done or who did something, we didn't have access to that anymore. And of course, we, we lost a lot of time. If, if you go back and look at growth curves for the BSDs and growth curves for Linux, at that time, BSD kind of, it was growing. It looked like it was doing really good. And then it kind of hits this flat spot. And during that flat spot, Linux does this to us. And that was just an unfortunate event of timing. There's nothing that we can go back and change that piece of history. Um, the other interesting things that have happened in the CVS history um, is CVS is not an ideal tool. We've adopted it at SVN today, which is a better tool. I won't call it ideal. It has its own set of problems. But because CVS doesn't give you a way to easily move files around, its mechanism is basically you delete it here and add it back over here, which means you lose all the history and version numbers start over again. And, and 
you still have the old copy and the old place is still there. Um, just put into an attic so it isn't hit, hidden. So out of, out of that inefficiency in CVS, one of the ways to try and get around that is to do what are called re repository copies. When the AMD code was brought up in, in the repository in FreeBSD, which was, was quite a while after I had even left the project, let alone being the repository manager. Uh, we've lost the mic, uh-oh. Did it come back? Or have I got a dead battery? <laughs> no, they're both there. I think they're both there. Check one, two? Yeah, let's try and replace the battery in this one. I know that, but why do we lose it here? This. Sh That's the house speakers, isn't it? This dog is for the hammer. Can you hear me now? Put in new batteries. Yeah, that's what the usual. How are we doing on time? Oh God, I gotta slow down. All right, we're talk. Check. Can you hear me back there now? Yeah. Okay. Dead battery. Yeah, I didn't touch that one other than take it off my lapel. So, um, let's see, where was I? Oh, we were talking about the repository and how to mangle things. Um, because CVS lacks the tools to do these things elegantly, you do what's called a, re a repository copy, which is basically you actually go into the repository itself, grab a tree of, of source files, move them over somewhere else, and then go in and mangle all the tags and some other things in it so that they don't if you check out an old version of the code, you don't end up with this new code you created. But that process isn't perfect. Um, because I imported the original repository, it means that the I th original I386 code um, leads back to my name and, and some, some early history because not all of that code had been, has been changed. The AMD64 code, if you go into the current SVN repository and track it back up to its first version, it says that I created that code sometime in 1994 or five, which is eight years, 12 years before the AMD 64 architecture was even available. Um, oops, <laughs> AMD, please pay me my royalties. Um, there's, uh, this talk went pretty quick. Um, I want to express a thanks to all of you that have participated in the project because that's what's brought it its success over the years. Um, there's a few people that have, have made it possible for me to get here today. Michael Dexter, IX Systems. And um, that's all I have for today. So we went pretty quick. There's. Um, Questions, I'll talk about just about anything. How late was everybody out last night? Are you, how, how, how awake are you this morning? Um, there, was, there was a large discussion last night at the Hotel Durant that was, was much more in depth. We actually spent a couple of hours talking about some of this stuff. So. You should have gotten your interview, Alan. We have 15 minutes now. Oh, up in the attic. There we, I didn't even know there's anybody sitting up there. Oh, you've been caught. <laughs> yeah. I wanted to hear more about the lawsuit. Okay. Okay, well then maybe, maybe we should have Kurt come up and talk about the lawsuit because he might be, he, he might be able to. Um, go ahead. So he, he was saying that uh, APP was doing FreeBSD or, or something to that effect. Uh, I was wondering what the connection is between AT&T and was it USL Novell? 
Um, the copyright and or trademark to Unix was originally belonged to AT&T. Um, at one point in that history, and Kirk may have to step in and correct me if I do this a little bit wrong, but I believe Unix System Laboratory, who is USL, was spun off of AT&T and given the trademark um, and the copyrights to the code. Novell came along and bought that piece of business. And so they had um, those rights. I believe the, the lawsuit originally started while well, those rights belonged to USL and it was originally the USL BSD lawsuit and then because Novell had entered into the picture and purchased that, it became the, the USL um, Novell lawsuit. The agreements um, that I know of are entered into between Novell and other parties. I don't, is that true of the university one as well? Is that signed by Novell's legal staff? So there's because of the ownership of their side of the copyrights were changing hands during it, it's not just literally, I believe there's court documents filed in at least both USL's and Novell's name, if not all three entities' legal names. Were there any documents that ever filed with AT&T on them? No. no. It, they owned it, but yeah. yeah. The, um, uh, probably the reason that, that AT&T is used in the name of it and stuff is that everybody knew that, that, that Unix originated out of AT&T. So, okay. Any other questions? Wow. Okay. Where did you originally get the inspiration for creating something like the court game? Um, I didn't want to see the benevolent dictatorship model um, used. I was worried about that model. I kind of had to walk in those shoes. I didn't like it. Um, I didn't think it would be good for the longevity of the project. Hopefully that was a good decision. It seems to have been. We're here 25 years later. Um, so yeah, I think that was, that was a real good thing. And that I couldn't do all of the things was the other problem. I just, I didn't have my, my depth of knowledge, I am a novice at very, very many different things and an expert at only a few. So, is there anything anybody wants to blame me for? I get, over the years, I randomly get contacts um, for pieces of code that I've only ever maybe read um, at one point in time, let alone have never made a commit to, but because I created the, imported the, the bits into the repository, um, I get blamed for a lot, of, a lot of things. I get blamed for blank lines. <laughs> uh, it's wonderful. <laughs> there was... Why did you leave? Um, that's a tough answer, and it's not an answer I don't know if we want to talk about. Um, <laughs> you're really putting me on the spot. It was asked last night, too. Um, one thing that happens when you spend too much time doing something and interacting with people that don't always necessarily interact with you well is tempers can get heated. Um, I became angry, damagingly angry at some things that were happening. Um, and so it was best for the project that I, I take a, a siesta from it. I was, I was biting people's heads off, just ridiculously bad and for stupid things. So, yeah. If any of those people are in the room, I'm sorry. <laughs> Uh-oh, I'm going to get heckled. Okay. Glenn. I'm not sure. I knew, I knew far better, um, but I'm glad I did. I'm not very actively involved, more actively than some people thought I would be, not um, as actively as I was, of course, in the early years. The, 
there's been, I, it was a learning experience for me. There's been a huge evolution in what goes on in release engineering, I will say that. I, I was release engineer for two and a half years or something like that, so everything up to about 2.0 you can blame on me. Is that it? Last chance. I haven't been to a conference in 20 years, so. Is there any one thing you would do differently? You had to do it over oh, you asked me that. Either you or, or John Baldwin asked me that at BSD Can. Is there anything I would do differently? Hmm. Probably a lot of things. Not one thing I can put my finger on today. Um, I'm not, yeah, I'm drawing a blank on that. I'm sorry, Alan. That's, oh, good. We're getting some, Deb? Denise. Denise, I'm sorry. Okay. What made you decide to get to here? What made me decide here? I don't. I don't. I, I'm, like I said earlier at the beginning of this, I'm not a public speaker. I actually get more comfortable as the time goes on. Um, the gentleman is hiding the, the, is the reason that I'm here. Is that Michael Dexter twisted my arm to... <laughs> We have, a, we have a meeting in Portland once a month. It's a, it's a, it's a small group of people that get together for pizza um, once a month. Michael goes to those. Um, he, yes, he tries to. And he, per, he, persu yeah, he persuaded me to, to go in his place to BSD can in July. The community was very, very receptive to what went on there. And then he persuaded and um, made the arrangements and, and made sure it was possible for me to come here this week. So Michael Dexter and, and IX Systems, who's, who's funded quite a bit of that effort. So yeah, that's, that's why I'm here today. This isn't something I enjoy doing. Um, I would much rather be sitting out there listening to some of the other talkers. And we've had some really good presentations here. I'm really impressed with what's, what's going on. And that's another reason I'm back. I was very impressed at what I saw at BSD CAN and wanted to see some more of it. I saw some other hands that, yes? So we've all seen where the project has gone since you made that first commit. But I'm interested in, in what your vision was, what you thought. Where I thought it would go? I had no idea. I'm very impressed with what happened to it. Um, at that time, it was a small community. I mean, there were, were 10 or 15 that were extremely active. Um, involved in it. There was a community of several hundred people across the Usenet groups, but I never, I think we have 300 and some odd source committers now. Glenn? Sounds about right. 380, something like that. I never ever expected the project to go to grow to that size. Um, I don't even know, have any idea what the user, user count is. I expected we knew CSRG was shutting down, and we knew that that source of evolution of the source code was coming to an end. Um, I, I just, it's, it's amazed me. I, I didn't really have a target vision. It wasn't, I, I just wanted to do it. I love operating systems. I've, I've been experienced in a lot of internals. Michael. No, 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 there wasn't, there, w there wasn't really a target. Of course, we, we, we knew things like, you know, Sun, Sun Microsystems like to use Sun OS, and there were, you know, there were a lot of commercial uses of Unix and stuff, but I don't think, that would, that would have more fallen into Jordan's realm at that time frame of, of what's going on externally. He, he's the one that found this Walnut Creek CD-ROM. Um, that was, a, was a, a vendor marriage situation, Walnut Creek, produced the first CD-ROMs. He, he, they brought us our foundation um, executive, Justin Gibbs, just, and there's, I left that piece of the talk out. Maybe we should talk about that, Justin. Um, somewhere, someplace in some posting of Justin Gibbs is a description of me the first time he saw me, or I believe very early that he saw me, and, it, and it's a description that's very accurate. Um, of, of where I, what, what I was and, and what I was doing at that time. I actually lived at Walnut Creek CD-ROM for almost two years. 
Um, slept, slept on the machine room floor next to free fall. Anybody else? We're going to have a nice little break. Oh, no, oh, Alan's not going to stop. He's not going to let me get off this stage. Go ahead. So when they were trying to pick the name, what was your suggestion for what the name should be? <laughs> um, I believe BSD free and and or a derivative something like that. I was actually pretty close to what what Greenman came up with. My my thoughts were we had X free eighty six at that time was the X eleven release that we were using. And there's another founder that's often left out of history. Um, Richard Murphy has, was was heavily involved. He actually did all of our X eleven work um, in the, for the first several years of the project, but. Um, Somewhere there is an archive of that mailing list discussion because I know that was saved. I don't know where it is. I have no idea. Um, there was FreeBSD, BSD Free. Um, there, there were, I believe, four or five in, that we voted on, and it, and it became. It was very. Um, single modal. I mean, FreeBSD outshined by far. Come on, let me off here. No more questions from Alan. Somebody else has to come up with a question. Back in the just uh, <laughs> I, there isn't any forward movement in the code. There's been some some discussions made and some. Um, I guess I should repeat the question. This CTL was the presentation that that I did for Michael in at BSD Can. It's it's the we have a need to have smart um, disk drive reporting tools in base, which means non GPL for us, um, which is a target, and um, the. The progress in that area is very slow and painful. I've, I've done a little bit more looking around. Um, there is some additional people that have, have surfaced that are interested in doing some work. But there's, huh? I, yep, okay, we should talk later. Okay, um, people, people that, that, if you wanna to talk to me, walk up to me and talk to me, okay? I'm no different than you are. Don't, don't um, shy away. I'm very, very amenable to conversations. Kirk. The hub was a, uh, a machine that had a lot of magic in it that really never got to be changed very much. Do you have any of the early history of what, how hub came into existence? No. <laughs> I get to skate on that one. I can, I, I, I can talk about some other names that people may have heard, but, but hub was actually put in, um, after I had physically left Walnut Creek CD-ROM, I believe I was still cursory involved working from Portland. I was still committing at that time, but I do not um, know. I know it wasn't Peter Wim, it was... Um, Glenn, help me out. Who, who put Hub in? I think it was Jordan. Jordan Hubbard may have put, put th that in. Um, there were a couple of machines that were very early that all have skydiving related names. There's Freefall, which I picked the name of, and, and everybody knows that name. It still lives today. Um, there were my machines that I personally brought to Walnut Creek, Creek are called Ground Rush and Sky Rush, which are belly to earth freefall or back to earth freefall, which you're looking at the sky. Um, when, I believe it was, this is another one of Jordan's name. When Jordan, um, got to name a machine there. It was called FUD, I believe. <laughs> and that's failure to use your parachute. Um, going once. Yes. Uh, what's your favorite memory of uh, working with a guy in the early days? Oh, let's see. Favorite. That would be, well, we don't have to say, we won't make it the favorite. We'll say a good memory. We, the, um, there was a gentleman working on high performance computing and the first local group of us met down at his house in, I wanna say Sunnyvale, maybe Santa Clara. And it was a 
very good evening. It was, it, we didn't, it, it wasn't a technically oriented, it was a social event um, that just a lot of technical people were at. Um, more like what we have as a hallway session nowadays, it was much more like that. That was a, it was a very, very good evening. Open the balcony again. Yeah. I, was, I was wondering if you could tell us about uh, FreeBSD's path off of X11 server. FreeBSD's path away from <coughs> X11? That's way post me. Um, I can tell you this is with something that I wasn't happy when I saw it. Um, but things like that happened. I'm not happy with the fact that we're not running Bind today. When I first saw that, I went like, what? Bind's going out of the tree, but the technical reasons for Bind going out of the tree, I can completely reinforce. That, it's a good technical decision. Oh, well, Bind goes. We can't put Python in the base. It just doesn't make sense. So those, those types of things happen. But I cannot speak to, I was not around when that decision was made. So, and I don't even know the technical reasons that decision was made. I, you have to understand that I physically left Walnut Creek CD-ROM in, I think, 95, and I left the project about 1997. So um, how many people were here were involved in the project before 19, let's go, before the year 2000? So, it was, okay. How many before 1995? Yeah, yeah, well, I, should, I should know who you are then. <laughs> But only a few, and that was, that was true. I think we had four or five of us at BSD CAN. Kirk, you were involved, that's no fair. You, well, no, you weren't. You, okay. Yeah, that's a piece of history that, that's also not talked about a whole lot and stuff. Kirk had a very colored involvement in many different aspects of the project. I mean, he, I had a NetBSD commit bit um, and, and a, a login on their machine, which I can't remember the name of. Um, and I know you were working with Chris at that time, and I don't. I, I was never clear on what the relationship between NetBSD and the CSRG group was, but it was fairly tight. Um, obviously, they were both going on here in the campus. I think Chris's machine, his private machine, was in the, his dorm room or something, wasn't it? Yeah. So. Yes. You mentioned that you had seen other benevolent dictator models that you didn't like. What are some um, <laughs> uh, do we want to talk about in the open source world or do we want to talk about in, in business in general? Uh, probably both, um, quite a bit. I had, of course, spent 10 years in industry at that point in time and had seen a lot of, of projects run by benevolent dictators that didn't do well. Um, more than anything, I think it was the idea that I was going to become that benevolent dictator and felt that was a bad idea. Um, knowing, knowing that I, typical volunteership and stuff, people work on or exist in something for five years. That's the average. So that means the person that's only there for a year is offset by somebody that's there nine years. Um, the person that was there for a month is offset by somebody that, that was there for 25 years. Um, and I just, I didn't want that. I didn't want it to be me. Um, it also gave me exit capability if I needed to. Was I wrong? Was it a good decision? You know, I don't know. It seemed to have worked. You know, some of the benevolent dictators have been there as long as we have. So, but a lot of them haven't. Don't know. I don't like the, the Linux model. I can say that. But it's not saying that it's necessarily wrong because they've done very well. I'm going to have to stop talking soon. My throat's getting sore. Okay, folks. Thank you very much. <laughs>